All right. Welcome everybody to our Friday night wealth creation course. We are here this week talking about retirement accounts. Okay. Now uh, this is an area of expertise for me. I've been in the financial industry for almost 10 years now. And really one of the first things I learned about was the retirement account. Actually, let me give uh, uh, Instagram a live real quick. One of the first things I learned about personally was the retirement account. And uh, basically I want to share with you my knowledge and expertise on the topic. Now, before we get started tonight, I want to go through just our normal items that we hit every week. Um, so number one, this is a financial education course, okay? Which means we're going to be talking about financial education. I know there's a lot of other stuff going on in the world right now, politics and uh, really just politics and Bitcoin, if you boil it all down. <laughs> but we're not going to talk about any of those things. We're going to talk about finances, Okay, and the reason for this course, the purpose of this course, the reason why I do this every single week I have for the last three years now, and I do these free is because this was information that I wish I had. Okay, I'm 28 now. Uh, I've built a multi-million dollar company, a multi-million dollar personal net worth. Um, I've helped thousands of families improve their finances across the United States. And um, it never ceases to, to uh, occur to me like the fact that we don't learn about finances ever. We don't learn about them in school. We don't learn about them in college. Uh, our jobs don't really provide much information on them. And so a lot of us, we go through life with this, this area of finances, but we don't know how they work, right? It's kind of like, like growing up and, and, and being born and not becoming privy to the fact that, that life has something called gravity and oxygen. And then just wondering why when you don't breathe, you feel like you're going to die. Okay, and wondering why when you jump off stuff, you fall and hurt yourself. Like, how hard would life be if you didn't realize those were things and you didn't realize how they worked? And it sounds silly, but money is that fundamental that it is silly to not know how it works. It, it is the equivalent of not understanding gravity and not understanding oxygen. Okay, like you will be that, that life, life will be that much more difficult. Life will be that much more hard. Things will be that much more confusing without a financial understanding. So again, we're covering financial education here. Um, now, I understand for a lot of us, this is a complex topic. It's not an area that we've learned about. When we do hear about it, we hear about it from the fat cats on Wall Street who make everything sound a lot more sophisticated and difficult than it really is um, so that we feel like we need them. And so they use all these big terms and, and, and it's called nomenclature, like specialized vocabulary that makes them sound really smart and makes us feel really stupid and makes us think we need them, right? So if you hear me talking like that or you feel like I'm talking like that, I want you to stop me and ask questions. So if I say anything that goes over your head that you don't understand, that maybe misses a beat with you or you don't, you don't understand how it works, I want you to stop and ask questions in the comments because the purpose of this course is to improve your personal finances, okay? So drop those in the comments. Um, finally, and lastly, be respectful. Okay, so if you're on, on Facebook, Zoom, completely honest, mostly it's Instagram, be respectful. Nobody cares, you know, whatever, you know, perverted remark you have or, or stupid comment. Like there are people here that are watching this to learn. So if you're not one of them, please don't disrupt those that are. Um, you can just quietly exit the stream and no one will, no one will be mad if you do that. We'll be proud of you for taking the higher road. So before we jump into this, guys, we are covering another chapter from my book, How to Create Wealth. Okay. So how to create wealth by Jerry Feta. Um, I am Jerry Feta. I'm the author of this book, the CEO of Wealth Dynamics. And I have not had a haircut for eight months just to add that on there as well. Um, <laughs> but we're going to cover a chapter called the 401k lie. Okay. The 401k lie. This is a chapter I wrote in this book. I wrote this two or three years ago. And um, I'm going to go into the history of retirement accounts. Okay. A lot of us, we have them. We've heard about them. They offer them at our jobs. And it's one of those things that we just assume we, we need and should have because it's a good idea. And not a lot of us actually understand what they are. To give you some background and some context, okay? I became a licensed financial advisor in 2012, okay? And the retirement plan was not something that I was familiar with up until that point, okay? So that means that all the way up until that point, like I didn't understand what a retirement account was. My family didn't use them. Say we were not a family. My mom and dad were not parents that, um, you know, they were big on this stuff. They didn't use retirement plans. They didn't save money. They didn't invest money. So it was really a foreign concept for me. And so when I started to learn about this, I started to um, really consider, okay, well, when would this be used and how is it used and, and trying to understand it better. 
And it kind of was just way over my head. And I started learning about, okay, there's this thing, a retirement account, and I can put money in it and I can save on taxes and it can go into this thing called a mutual fund, which at the time sounded like the greatest thing on earth to me. And I thought it was, I thought it was the best. I was excited about this. I was like, I can help people with retirement accounts right now. Little did I know, I actually now in present time, think most of them are a terrible idea. And I say most of them, not all of them, because there are, there are ways that they can be done right. Okay. But really quickly, I want to just define and dive into what a retirement account is. Um, let me make myself a host actually. Lexi, what did you make the username on this guy? It's logged in as me. All right, I'm going to be doing some screen sharing. So I'm just figuring out a new new uh, setup we have. Allow to multi-pin. I think I want to do that. Okay, cool. So this should allow me to uh, share my screen on Zoom here. Good. Let me know when you guys can see this. Again, we're using a new setup. So I want to make sure that we are able to... Uh, Show this to all of you guys. Don says, don't draw. It's too late, Don. It's going to happen. Just go with it. Uh, okay, so we have a new whiteboard set up on Zoom. So a retirement account, right? Now, this is actually going to be neater drawing, Don. So check this out. We have retirement accounts. And I want to go over what a retirement account actually is. Okay. Now, there's several different types of retirement accounts, right? So we're all used to hearing about the 401k. Who's ever heard about the 401k before? Okay, so we've heard about the 401, 401k. Okay, so that's a primary one. Another one is called an IRA. This is individual retirement account. Okay, we have a Roth IRA. We have something called a 403b. If you're a, 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 a public employee, you might have something called a TSP or a thrift savings plan. These are all types of retirement accounts. Okay. Now the idea behind a retirement account, the idea behind it is that I would put money into it, right? So I'm going to put my earned dollars into it. And the primary purpose of a retirement account is actually to, to defer taxes. A lot of us don't know this. So the first thing that I'm thinking about with a retirement account is deferring taxes. So defer taxes, this is the main reason we do them. Now I hit this first because when you think about retirement account, I want you to think about when I said the first thing they're for, did you think defer taxes or did you think free match? Okay, let's let's see a survey. Like who thought it was deferring taxes? Who thought it, the purpose of retirement account was to get a free match? Okay, a lot of us, we think it's the free match. We're like, well, of course you get a 3% or a 6% or a 9% and it's free money and that's why I do the retirement account. That's actually not. Okay, that's not what the retirement account is for. So if you actually do the research on this, which I did, I was in the industry for probably five or six years before I actually looked this up and researched it. A retirement account, especially a 401k, is a type of deferred compensation plan. Okay, let's break that down. What does deferred mean? Deferred means later, right? So I'm getting my compensation later, deferred compensation plan. If I have a deferred compensation plan, uh, that means that instead of getting my wages today, I'm going to put the wages off tomorrow. Nothing magic about that, right? So instead of getting the wages today, I'm going to put them off till tomorrow. Now, the other factor on this is instead of paying taxes on them today, I'm paying taxes on them tomorrow as well. So when we think about this concept of deferring, again, we're not going to take the money today. So we have a wage. We're not taking that money today. We're going to do it tomorrow instead. Now, if we didn't take this money today, is the IRS going to tax us today? No, they can't tax us on something we didn't earn. So we're going to pay the taxes on it tomorrow as well. That's the entire purpose of a retirement account. That's all it is. Now, if you do the research on this, once again, the, the retirement account was invented in 1979. Okay, by a guy named Ted Benna. Okay. Not Ted Bundy, Ted Benna. Okay. So <laughs> Ted Benna was the guy that introduced this, this retirement account. He found something in the tax code that said that he was allowed to set up a trust for his employees at his company. And he was able to have them contribute money into this account, defer the wages. And then he, as the employer was also allowed to defer their wages. 
Now, this is important to understand because this idea of deferring wages, we, we might not understand this right off the bat, but I want you to realize that the idea of deferring wages happens on both sides. So this match that we get on the retirement account is not actually a match. It's a deferral of our income from our employer. So we have the employee contribution. So employee, and then we have the employer, right? So if it's a deferred compensation plan, that means that me as the employee, I can elect to defer my dollars off till tomorrow, not pay taxes on them. Okay. That also means that the employer gets to do the same thing. So the employer, when they're matching us, they're not giving us free money. They're actually decreasing our current, our, our current day wage, our present day wage. They're decreasing it and they're going to pay it to us in this account to defer it till later. By doing that, they also get a tax benefit. They can write it off on their taxes, just like they paid us. And also they don't have to pay payroll tax on it. Okay. So I want to hit this because it changes this idea of retirement account. Now, doesn't mean they're bad. It means that they're misunderstood. Okay. People think that it's this magic account and they get a free match and really they get a, a wage reduction. Okay. Employers surveyed and they said when they, when they match a retirement account, it is a 99 cent on the dollar wage reduction. Meaning if I'm getting a 3% match, my compensation is being reduced by 99% on that 3%. So I'm basically losing 3% of my, my compensation. Okay. So that's not really a bonus. And, and I'm stressing this because the match is not the reason to do the retirement account. We have to get this out of our heads. We do not do the retirement account because we get a free match because it's not a free match because it's not a match. It's deferred compensation on both sides. So we're just refusing income today and accepting that income later instead. Okay, so then that, that brings us back. If that's not the purpose of a retirement account, what is the purpose? Okay, what is the purpose? Well, let's look at what we can do with one, right? When we have a retirement account, what are our options? whether it be a 401k or an IRA or any of the ones that I mentioned, the first thing we have the option of doing is deferring taxes. Okay, that's unique to a retirement account, deferring taxes. Okay, on some of them, we can also reduce our taxable income. Okay, so we can take a deduction on the income. That's really the only thing that's unique to a retirement account. Okay, I can invest in mutual funds anywhere. I can invest in real estate anywhere. I can contribute money to an account anywhere. There's nothing unique about those qualities. What is unique is that I can reduce my income by the amount that I contribute and then I can defer the taxes on that growth. Okay, that's, that's all it is. So, so when you really boil this down, and this is again, a piece of insider information that I got, I didn't learn this till maybe seven years in this industry, like a 401k is really just a trust. Okay, we think 401k, we think it's this tangible thing. Like, man, I have a 401k and it's this thing and it exists. It doesn't, it's a trust. It's literally a piece of tax code, Internal Revenue Code Section 401k. That's where that comes from. It, it defines a type of trust that I can set up as an employer and allow my employees to defer their income into it. Okay, now, now what happened is again, in 1979, this became usable and widely known and Wall Street ended up like kind of taking over the system. But when I realized a 401k is just a trust, a trust is a legal entity that I would set up and I would allow it to own things as its own entity rather than me personally. So families would set up trusts to protect assets, to shelter assets, to do legacy planning if they wanna pass down assets to their kids, to their grandkids, to their charities. That's what trusts are for. So a 401k is a type of trust. It's not like its own thing. It's a trust classified under Internal Revenue Code 401k. There's nothing special about that, okay? So if it's a trust, a trust is nothing other than literally a legal document defining the rules and provisions of the trust. And then usually a trust is gonna have an account attached to it. So check this out. If we have a trust, the first thing you're gonna have is a document. Okay, so you're gonna have an actual trust document that defines the rules and provisions of the trust, right? The second thing you're gonna have is you're gonna usually have some kind of account, whether that be a bank account or a brokerage account or whatever it might be. And then you're also then going to have assets. And the way that a trust works is all of these things sit inside this trust, right? And this trust protects it. So when I'm putting my income into this account, 
it's a trust. I'm putting my income into it. All of the assets, the money, anything I'm dropping into this is being sheltered by this trust. That's it. Okay. Nothing about this says mutual funds. Okay. And I keep saying mutual funds because that's what most people invest their 401k in. When they get a retirement account, they get it from their financial advisor or they get it from their job. And either at their job, they're going to get a list of things they're allowed to invest in. Right. And they're going to basically take that list and run with it. Or if they're working with a financial advisor, their financial advisor as an expert is going to go on the menu of things that your financial, financial advisor can pick from and tell you what's a good idea. And it's usually going to be stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, maybe annuities, right? Now, why is that? Because again, in 1979, Ted Benna invented this. He pulled it from the tax code. He made it a thing. Ted Benna was not a Wall Street guy, Okay. Ted Bennett made this as a trust. You could put anything into it at that point. Okay. Now around the same time, 1979 was when we started getting rid of pensions. Companies used to offer pensions. They started getting rid of pensions. A pension was where you would get a guaranteed income stream for your entire life. Once you retired, doesn't matter what your balance was. You didn't keep track of a balance. You just get income. Companies started realizing they, they promised more than they could afford on pensions. They needed a good reason to get rid of them and they needed something they could replace it with. So they looked at this and said, what about this 401k? Okay. They said, what about this thing? Now, what they did is super genius from a business standpoint, but it's insidious because people don't realize it. Okay. So a 401k is a trust. So what Wall Street did is they had, we have Wall Street over here. They set up two different entities. They set up a trust company and then they set up a custodial company. Now realize that they were already an investment company, right? So they already had investments down here. So they were looking at how do we sell more of our investments, right? So it's, it's basically, they looked at this idea and said, okay, well, if we can, if we can take this 401k thing, what would we have to do to get, to get this set up? We would need a trust company. So they all set up trust companies. Then they said, okay, well, we need a custodian. A custodian is the person that takes care of and holds the funds. So they set up custodial companies. And then they said, now in these custodial companies, we're going to tell our clients that they can only buy our investments. Genius, right? So if I buy a 401k from American funds, I can, only, <clears throat> I can only invest in what American funds tells me I can invest in. That's not an IRS rule. That's an American's fund rule. If I have a Fidelity 401k, I can only invest in what Fidelity tells me I'm allowed to invest in. That's not an IRS rule. That's a Fidelity rule. Why? Because Fidelity designed your trust and Fidelity is your custodian. And Fidelity does not want you buying things that they don't make fees off of. So this thing called the 401k, it ended up becoming a Wall Street mule. The retirement account, the IRA, same thing, okay? You can set up an IRA with a trust company and a custodial firm. They took those over. Let's set up a trust company and a custodial firm. Now, when you buy an IRA from American funds or whoever you get it from, you're only going to be able to buy their stuff. Do you see that? So what happens is we put money into the 401k or the IRA and we think we're making a good decision right? We think that we're saving money. Really what we're doing is we're doing what's called financial consumerism and it's, dis it's disguised as saving. Okay. We're not actually saving. We are buying a product. We are buying a product from an investment firm. That's not saving. That's consuming. Okay. Consumers are broke and make no money. Producers, they have the money. So Wall Street being the producer said, how do we sell something to the consumer, making them feel like they're a producer so that we can sell more of our investments to them? What are the rules with their investments? Well, they can't guarantee anything but the fees. That's the only rule. They can't guarantee returns, performance, that it's going to be there, that they're going to stay in business, but their fee is guaranteed. Okay, so they're going to make money whether you do or whether you don't. But what happens is as soon as you put money in that IRA, as soon as you put money in that 401k, it's not yours anymore. Okay. The rule with these accounts is that you can't use this money till you're 59 and a half. Okay. So if I put money in this deal with them and I do an IRA or a 401k or whatever it might be, and let's say I do an IRA, an individual retirement account, and I start contributing to it and maxing out my $6,000 a year contribution. Okay. This money is going to go into these investments these investments in theory are going to grow. Okay. So they're going to get some gains. 
They're going to get some losses. I'm going to pay some fees. But the way that this is set up is I can't touch this money or any of the growth until I'm 59 and a half years old. That means for the next 20 or 30 years, 20 or 30 years, Wall Street gets my money. Okay, they get to get fees off of it. They get to manipulate the market with it. They get to make anything they want to make with my money. I can't touch it till I'm freaking 60. Okay, again, I'm 28. So 60 is a long time from now, right? Now, if I pull this money out prior to 60, then what happens is I pay a 10% penalty on the entire balance and I pay income tax on the entire balance, which is going to be larger than it is now, right? So whatever my income taxes are, state and federal, and generally speaking, I'm going to lose half of what I have, right? So, so here's the issue is like when I'm doing a retirement account, and again, this is from my book, How to Create Wealth, I have to understand when it's a good idea or not. So the 401k lie is that the 401k is something we should all do right off the bat, okay? And we can generalize this even more that the retirement account is something we should do right off the bat, okay? But let me ask you, if I'm in this position here, where I'm, I'm looking at, okay, I want to do a retirement account. I want to start putting money away and, and saving and investing and getting my finances in order. Does it make sense for me to do this if I am broke? Like presently broke. Let's say I have no money saved. Okay, does it make sense for me to put my money into something that I can't touch till I'm 59 and a half if I don't have savings right now? In my, in my opinion, it doesn't. If I don't have savings right now, that means that if I lose my job, I'm screwed, right? If I get injured, I can't pay the deductible on my health insurance. If I get in a car wreck, my car is gone because I can't cover the thousand bucks for the insurance. 60% of Americans actually couldn't right now, like watching this stream right now, six out of 10 people don't have a thousand bucks. Okay, you never know because it's Instagram and Facebook and everyone wants to appear like they're doing better than they are. But that's the reality. Six out of 10 people don't have a thousand bucks. Eight out of 10 can't pay their bills next week. Okay, so this is most people broke. This is not mean. This is not picking on people. This is facts. This is what's happening right now. People are broke. Okay, so if I am broke, then does it make sense for me to give my money to Wall Street? Where they're going to make money off of it. Like I said, the fees are the only thing guaranteed. And I can't use any of this till I'm 59 and a half. Guys, I'm, if I'm broke, I'm broke now. Not when I'm 59 and a half. Like, why am I planning for when I'm 59 and a half at the neglect of don't have a thousand bucks in the bank, paycheck to paycheck, swimming in consumer debt? That's the other one. If I have debt, right? If I have debt, does it make sense to use a retirement account? No, it doesn't. If I have, if I have credit cards, student loans, car payments, why would I siphon money out and put it into my retirement account when I could be paying off my car and keeping more of my income? Okay, if I just went to college for four years and spent 60,000 so that I can get a job that pays me 50,000, why would I then enroll in the retirement account there and reduce the amount of income that I have and increase the amount of time I stay in debt? Okay, what you don't know is, is, is these guys on Wall Street, these are the same guys that are loaning you the money for the car or the house or the student loan. They're making money on you on both ends. Right? So they're already getting my money on this loan. Why would I give it to them in this retirement account as well? Okay. Now I, I kind of want to, po I'm polarizing this on purpose so that you see that the retirement account is not automatically a good idea. Okay. There are, there are circumstances here, right? One of the circumstances is what's my current financial condition. If I'm broke, I don't need to be doing something with wall street right now. I don't need to be deferring my income. Okay. Here's the other big one. If you guys are watching and you're thinking about, all right, well, when would I do a retirement account? Okay. The first thing I have to look at is again, what is the purpose of it? The purpose of it is to defer my taxes. So if the purpose of it is to defer my taxes, I need to look at, is it something I need to be worried about right now? Okay. There's something called a tax to income ratio. Okay, this is not your tax bracket. This is what percentage of your earned income literally goes to taxes. Okay, brackets mean between this number and this number, I'm going to pay this much percent. And I'm saying at the end of the year, count up everything you paid in taxes and divide it by your gross income. That is your tax to income ratio, right? So if I have an IRA and I put $6,000 in the IRA, that's going to reduce my taxable income by $6,000, right? 
if I'm in a 20% tax bracket, that's going to sell me, save me 1200 bucks on taxes, right? So I spend or invest 6,000 so that I can save 1200. Okay. So I've reduced my taxes by $1,200. Now I would have to then reduce my taxes every single year, putting money in the account every single year. It's not a residual thing. It's a once a year thing. Next year, I have to repeat it in order to get the same effect. Right. So let's say that my tax to income ratio is 17%, because that's what most people are 17%. Okay. So that means for every hundred bucks I make, I'm going to spend 17 cents on debt. Right. Now, the other thing that I should be looking at here is my debt to income ratio. So if I have a debt to income ratio, that means the total amount of money that I spend on debt divided by the total amount of income that I earn in a year. <clears throat> that's going to give me a percentage. That percentage is my ratio. Okay. The average American between their, ho their home, their car, their credit card, their house, the, all of student loans, everything, they're usually 30 to 40% debt to income ratio. Right? So just look at the basic math on this. My debt to income ratio is 30 to 40%. My tax to income ratio is 17%. If I have six grand right now, is it smarter for me to put the six grand towards reducing my taxes, which is only a 17% cost? Or is it smarter for me to put my six grand towards reducing my debt, which is a 30 to 40% cost? Not only that, the debt's residual, meaning that if I don't pay it off next year, I will pay it again. If I do pay it off next year, I won't pay it again. Versus the retirement account, if I put the six grand in this year, I won't pay it. Next year, though, I will. This year's six grand doesn't do anything for me next year. So if I'm looking at the time value of money, that $6,000 is better spent on reducing my debt. Okay. So rule number one about retirement accounts is if you have consumer debt, you have no business using a retirement account. You don't need to be deferring your income. You need to be using your income to reduce your debt. Even if I had a 5% debt to income ratio, instead of 30 to 40, I would still tell you pay off the debt first right? Because this 5%, if I don't pay off the debt first, it's going to happen every single year. And it's going to, it's going to compound and it's going to grow. And if I add up the amount of years that I have this 5% going out, it's going to be more than the maybe 20% that I'm going to save on my taxes here. You guys see that? So, so we're thinking like, like an investor here. I'm not thinking about what's popular or what does my boss say, or what is the auto enrollment paperwork at my job at my 401k say, or what does my financial advisor say? I'm actually looking at my stats. Okay. Statistically, does it make sense for me to do this? In this situation, it doesn't. Now, the other thing that you would look at on this is if I have the debt taken care of, the other thing you'd look at on this are what is my housing cost, right? This is another ratio you would look at housing to income. That's another one. So, so the average American spends more than 25% of their income on housing. More than 25% of their income on housing. So once again, if I have six grand and I'm looking at, do I put the six grand in a retirement account and save 17 cents on the dollar once, or do I put the six grand towards reducing my housing and save at least 25 cents on the dollar every single year? Which one's a better idea? Housing. Okay. Now there are, are circumstances and ways that you go about this. So I'm not saying go pay off your mortgage and, and, and have no housing debt, but I am saying if you structure things correctly, you would be able to get this number, this 25% housing lower than your 17 on the taxes. Okay. At that point, then it makes sense. Yeah. The 17% is the highest thing I pay. I'm going to reduce that. Right. But people don't think about this. People don't think this way. Instead, they think I'm going to get a free match. I'm going to do it. And then they end up with debt, housing, and taxes. Okay, the taxes are slightly lower, but they don't actually put more than the 3%. They just do the 3%, right? So, so these are all things that, that aren't considered when we're doing retirement accounts. And so what I want to kind of go through is how I would go about this, okay? So if I'm looking at, if, if I'm currently doing a retirement account, that's the first thing I'd look at, right? So we just talked about three areas. We have our taxes, we have debt, and housing. 
we could call this like the triangle of like financial burdens, right? These are the three biggest burdens anyone pays. So if I'm looking at this and I currently am putting money into an IRA or I'm currently putting money into a 401k or really anything that defers my income, the first thing I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at, okay, well, what am I spending? What's the percentage of each of these guys on my income? Just like we looked at. Okay. If my debt's higher than my taxes, I'm not doing the retirement account. If my housing costs higher than the taxes, I'm not doing the retirement account. Okay. Now, if my taxes are higher than all of these things, and again, I, I would say the debt needs to be zero. The housing doesn't need to be zero. It just needs to be lower. But if my, if my debt's gone, okay, and my taxes are higher than my housing, then yeah, I'm going to do the 401k or I'm going to do the IRA. Right. So that's like a simple way you would go about it. Now, inside of this, you've got to realize if you are going to do it, who are you doing it with and what's their goal? So like we talked about, we have a couple of layers here. We have the 401k itself, which is an internal revenue code code. It means IRC internal revenue code. So internal revenue code 401k. Right. So when you think I have a 401k, even an IRA is just a, a tax law. So these things are not like the, like we think of them like a water bottle. Like it's a, like it's a hard, tangible thing. It's not, it's a, it's a law. There's a tax code called 401k. There's a law that says I can do an IRA. That's it. Right. But if I'm looking at this stuff and I'm looking at this and saying, okay, the 401k is just a tax law. The IRA is just a tax law inside of this. In order to make this tax law apply, I need to have a trust company. Okay. I need to have a custodian right? And then I also need to have investments. So when you're looking at this, I want you to understand these are the players on your team. They might all wear the same exact Jersey. Like I said, it might be fidelity and fidelity is the trust company, the custodian and the investment company. But you need to understand that if you don't realize there's three players in one Jersey, then it's going to be confusing for you to understand that you could be doing other stuff with your money. You could be doing other investments. Like, did you know with a 401k, you can actually find a trust company and a custodian, like Jose is saying, that will allow you to self-direct your retirement account. Meaning they'll let you pick anything. They're not just saying, hey, you can only pick the mutual funds we sell. They're saying, if you want to do real estate, great, do real estate. If you want to do gold and silver, do gold and silver. If you want to do private lending, do private lending. Right? So, so like the idea that that, all three of these are separate for me was a game changer. Cause again, as a financial advisor, I did not know this and ever, and I was an American funds guy. I would sell people American funds, mutual funds, because Dave Ramsey said so. And it's a 12% return and yada, yada, yada. Every time, every time I'd fill out an account, there would be American funds. And then there would also be on the logo capital bank and trust CB and T. I didn't know who capital bank and trust was till I realized, Oh, capital bank and trust capital bank is the custodian. And then they're a trust company as well. And they're, and they're owned by American funds so that you can only pick American funds in, in the deal, right? So the trust company, like what are the roles here, right? So we have the internal revenue code. The role here is law. The internal revenue code makes the 401k or the IRA law. So it makes it legal. Okay, it, it says, it says this, is, this is allowed per the tax code. Here are the laws, here are the provisions, that's it. Okay. And then, and then after this, we have the trust company, the trust company actually builds the plan document. So plan document and compliance. These are the hats or the roles of each of these members of your team. If you have a retirement account, right? So their, their job is to build a plan document that corresponds with the 401k or the IRA or whatever tax law you're using. Okay. And then the other thing is the internal revenue code. Okay, it has to stay compliant with that. So it has to be set up correctly and then it has to be monitored and maintained. So we have two things happening here. Now the custodian, their job is to actually house the funds. Okay, housing funds means they're holding the money. They're like, they're the bank account. The money has to go into an account. A 401k is not an account. It's a tax law. Now this tax law has a trust and that trust needs an account to keep the money in the account that belongs to the trust. So that's what the custodian does then they also do record keeping, right? Because again, we have to be able to prove to the IRS that we're staying compliant. So when the trust company says, hey, we're reviewing the plan documents, we need to know the values of the assets, we need to see the transactions, the custodian needs to be able to turn that information over to them 
so that these guys can then turn it over to the IRS and say, hey, yeah, this plan is compliant or oops, no, this plan is not compliant. What do we need to do to correct it? Okay. Now the investment company, <clears throat> their job is to sell. They're selling investments. That's it. Okay. So, so if I have an investment company and if I work this backwards, again, you have to really understand the business model. <clears throat> if I have a custodian and a trust company that was originally a mutual fund company, meaning they did not get in the retirement plan business to do a good job at being a custodian and trustee, they got into it because they thought they could sell more mutual funds. That was their purpose. Because again, if I do this with them, I'm trapped. I can only pick the investments that they allow. I have to stress this. If I do a IRA with, with Edward Jones, I will only be able to pick the investments that Edward Jones allows. Edward Jones will only allow the investments they earn fees on. That's simple, right? So if they started out as an investment company and their purpose was to sell investments and make fees, and then later they got into the game of being a trust company and a custodian, what is their interest? Think about that. What are they interested in? It's not doing a good job setting up plan documents and compliance. Not saying they're not going to do that, but that's not why that's not why they got in the business. That's not where they make their money. Okay, here's proof. If you set up an IRA with with American funds or Fidelity, it's usually free. It's usually free or it's going to be like 25 or 50 bucks. And the reason why is they know that they will make so much money on you with the investment side that they can give you away a free IRA. Some of my clients that set IRAs up with us are like, hey, why is it, why is it a thousand bucks to set up an IRA? Because we don't, we don't charge you fees. We don't make a percentage of every dollar you have in your account till you're 60. It's called a lead loss. In business, a lead loss means a company is going to lose money on purpose to get you in the door. Costco does it with hot dogs. Okay, so this is Costco and these are hot dogs. They're going to give you free hot dogs so that you'll come in and buy all the crap in their investment Costco because they know that they'll make so much money on your investments that they can give you free hot dogs. See, when you think about it that way, I went to Houston high school. I didn't go to college or any of that nonsense. So when I think about some of this, like Costco, Right. So, so when I look at this, I have to look at, okay, well, do I really want wall street in charge of this where they're limiting me and only letting me buy their products? Or do I want to flip this? If I flip this, then I'm going to go the other direction, right? The other direction means that I'm going to go for a trust company and a custodian that lets me do whatever I want. Right. Like they're going to say, Hey, here's the IRS's rules and laws and regulations. We're going to build your plan documents to be compliant. We're going to make sure that you stay compliant and then just invest in stuff that you're allowed to invest in. It doesn't matter what it is. Okay. Did you know in a 401k, for example, there's only five things you're not allowed to invest in. You're not allowed to invest in automobiles. You're not allowed to invest in, in, in precious like coins not, not precious metals, precious coins like rubies and sapphires. You can't buy art, you can't buy alcohol, and you can't do restricted transactions. Those are the only five things you can't invest in in a 401k, which means everything else you can invest in. You could buy a franchise, you could put it in real estate, uh, you can lend it to somebody, you can buy gold and silver. All of those things are allowed in your 401k, but you went with a plan provider, a document company doing your trust and custodial services, that initially and originally was an investment firm that doesn't want you doing those things because they don't make money if you buy a McDonald's. They don't make money if you do private lending. Okay, in an IRA, same thing. You can buy precious metals, you can do real estate. There's some things you can't do in an IRA that you could do in a 401k, but you would never know that because when you sign up with an IRA, you only get what's given to you. So I'm telling you like understand this so you can flip it. Okay, so a couple of things I wanna go over that are myths. So the first thing here that I want you to look at is the, the 401k and the IRA, who is it created by? It's created by the internal revenue code, by the IRS. So one of the myths is that the 401k is, is like this thing that everyone should do and it's gonna be around forever and it's okay to put your money into. Th that's fine. I'm not saying don't put money into it, but I want you to realize it's a tax incentive. When the IRS gives you deductions, they're incentivizing you to behave the way that they want you to. So they're saying, if you put money in this account, we want you saving. Now, 
the reason why it's so out of hand is the government is in bed with Wall Street. So they also want you giving money to Wall Street, which is another reason why the 401k is okay with them. They're like, yeah, we'll let you put in 19 grand a year as long as you give it to our buddies over here. Right. But you have to realize that it's a tax law. So it could come and go at any time, just like any other tax law. Opportunity zones, they could be gone. Right. Section 179 deductions, they could be gone. The tax law can change. So you have to realize like this is something that right now is available. It might not always be available. So that's another truth of like, I have to have the mindset that this is something that could change. And so I have to understand the basics of it because if it does change, it's going to be replaced by something else. It's going to be really hard for me to understand the new thing if I didn't even know what the old thing was, right? So another thing is the tax deferral benefit. So again, with this, with this 401k or with this IRA, we're deferring our taxes, Okay, we're deferring our taxes. And by deferring our taxes, that means that when we pull the money out, yes, we will have to pay those taxes later. Okay, that's just how the game works. But we've got to look at when I withdraw the money, withdraw funds. Again, you can withdraw the funds at age 59 and a half. When I withdraw the funds, are taxes going to be higher or lower in the future? they're going to be higher. The, the compounding annual growth rate of income tax is one and a half to 2% a year. So I have to have a plan to mitigate that, right? Like it's great for me to save money on taxes, but if I'm putting money into this deal, not thinking about the fact that the taxes will be higher when I take the money out, then it's going to bite me in the butt. If I do this incorrectly, which is what 99% of people do, they just stick the money in and then they're like, fine, I don't have to think about it. And then when I'm 59, I can pull the money out. You're going to pay more in taxes than you ever saved, right? So if I save, like I said, I put in the six grand and I save 20% and that gives me 1200 bucks a year. I'm probably going to pay more than that when I pull the money out on the back side of this plan. If I'm in a 25, a 20% 20 tax bracket and my taxes go up by one and a half to 2% every single year till I'm 60, my tax rate then will be higher than it is now. It, it just will. Like, that's just how it works. So that's the first thing is taxes, right? So I have to understand how to withdraw the money and mitigate the taxes. We actually have ways to do that, but this has to be something you plan for. It's not something you reactively, you know, decide, oh crap, I have to pay these taxes now. Okay. Now, the other thing that you've got to look at is you have to look at inflation, Inflation means that our currency goes down in value, meaning that it costs more dollars to buy the same things. I had this conversation with a guy for a freaking hour on Facebook last night. He didn't understand the difference between currency and an asset. Okay. Currency is what I pay for things with, right? So when I have assets in an IRA or a 401k, and then I sell those assets and withdraw currency, that currency will have gone down in value. When I'm 60, that money will be worth less than it is today. Don't believe me. Ask your parents how much a car costed when they were your age, right? So it's, it's something I have to plan for. So we said that taxes is one and a half to 2% increase per year. What about inflation? Okay. Inflation, real inflation is about 5% a year. So what this means is that I'm going to pay a higher tax bracket, but I'm also going to have to withdraw a larger dollar amount to buy the same things that I buy today. That's the other myth is a financial advisor will straight up tell you, no, you only need 60 to 80% of your income today in the future because you're not going to need to live on as much because you'll be retired. No, your money is going to be worthless. A dollar today will be worth like 30 cents when you retire. So that means that in order for you to get the same buying power of $1 today, you would have to withdraw three. So if you withdraw $3, $3 in today's tax bracket, tax rate is already higher on taxes, right? Like if I make three bucks today, that three bucks is going to have a higher tax bill than one buck. But we're saying that it's three bucks and the actual rates are going to be higher too. So I'm withdrawing more income at a higher rate. So I have to plan for my exit. This is not something I can nonchalantly just stick money in a 401k and be like, yeah, I got my match and everything is good. And you know, my employer gave it to me and all my coworkers do it. And I'm just gonna let this thing ride and put it in the market because the market always goes up. And then when I'm 60, I can withdraw it. You're gonna get freaking killed if you do that. You're gonna have a tax problem. Now, 
the solution here is when you're an accredited investor, meaning you have a million dollar net worth or higher, you can withdraw this money tax-free from your IRA or 401k. Probably 0.01% of financial people know that. I know that because I do it, right? So if you have a strategy and if you're working with the right team, we can get you accredited so that by the time you withdraw that money, you owe no taxes on it. So that means you've got the deduction today and also you don't have to pay the taxes on it tomorrow, okay? But if you don't do it that way, then the tax deferral thing is actually a myth. Do you, like, think about this. Do you really think the IRS was going to let you, let you have a deal? The, the people that steal from every single one of your paychecks your entire life, do you really think they're like, oh yeah, we'll just do you solid? No, this is, this is like the scummiest scumbags you can imagine. There's going to be something in it for them. And the something that's in it for them is they're basically giving you a loan. They know that they're going to give you the deduction today. And then you're going to pull the money out tomorrow because you're oblivious and they're going to charge you more. Unless you do it this way. See, they don't intend for these things to mix. A lot of people don't even know that this is the thing you can do. But when you're accredited, you don't pay any taxes if you do it right. So then you avoid the IRS altogether. But that's the myth of tax deferral right? So that's something you've got to look at. Now, again, we've already covered the match, but I want to stress again, because this is one that honestly, I tell people and they don't believe it. You can look it up. Match equals wage decrease. Why? Because this is called a 401k. A 401k is a deferred compensation plan. We already hit this once today, but I'm repeating it because people don't get this. You are reducing your compensation. When your employer matches, they are also reducing your compensation. Meaning if it weren't for the 401k plan, you would be earning more money. Okay, so you have to look at, is the match the reason to do it? Because if you're just trying to get a free dollar, use life insurance, use gold. If, if I use life insurance, check this out. If I put money in a 401k, right? So I have my contribution of a dollar and I do that so that my employee employer will match me a dollar. And then both of these dollars grow, right? The employer dollar grows, my dollar grows, right? So both of these dollars grow, but they're deferred and I can't use them till 59 and a half. That's what I'm getting myself into. Now with life insurance, I can contribute a dollar right? That dollar I can then borrow against. So I can loan against the dollar. Now this money can grow and this money can grow, but I can use both of them now. So I can use this now and there's no taxes. You see that? The 401k, boom, put in the money, boom, get the match. Can't have it till I'm 59 and a half and then there's going to be taxes. So what I'm, what I'm pointing out here is if it's just about getting a free dollar, do freaking life insurance. You can do this with gold too. Like put money into it, leverage the dollar that you put into it, borrow against it, have it growing in two locations at once, have access to all of it now, not when you're 59 and a half and don't pay taxes on it because life insurance can't be taxed. See, but you don't hear about this because Wall Street makes no fees on this. They don't make fees on life insurance. They make fees on, on the 401k. So, so these are things you'd look at. The only reason I would do the 401k is to reduce my taxes. The, the match is a myth. Um, the other one is liquidity, right? So liquidity, meaning I can't access the money. Once I put it in there, we've talked about this. I put it in there. I can't use this till I'm 59 and a half. That means I have a liquidity issue. If I want that money, I'm going to pay income tax and, and, and a 10% penalty. Okay, 2020 was an exception. If you were uh, in 2020, if you were a client of mine, we did something called a corona-related corona distribution where you were able to access your 401k penalty-free and then we rolled it into a self-directed IRA so that you didn't pay the taxes either and we basically stole it from your employer legally using the tax code, right? But, but if I'm not doing the wealth dynamics method or the Jerry Feta method, then I'm going to have a liquidity issue with this money because I can't use it till I'm 59 and a half. Now you might say that's not a big deal, but let me ask you this. Do you really want to wait till you're 59 and a half to retire? Like that's a ways off. My story, I was my mom's financial advisor. She died at 60. Okay. So that means that I did all of the planning and set her up with the 401k and the account and everything like you're supposed to 59 and a half happens. Six months later, she passes away. 
So, so what if you don't make it that long? Like if you could get there at 40 instead, okay? Like, wouldn't you rather get there at 40 instead of 59 and a half? Like, do you really, and, and my point is, do you really want to wait till 59 and a half just because you're not allowed to do it earlier? If you were allowed to do it earlier, would you? Most of us would do it earlier if we were allowed to. We just don't know we can. And then finally, the last one is fees, okay? So fees, check this out. And, and if you're doubting me on the fees, what I want you to do is actually go do like a fee calculation. If you look at an annual fee calculator, a 1.25% annual management fee over 30 years equals 30% of your account. Okay, so if I put in a dollar and that dollar and that dollar grows and grows and grows and grows and grows, that means that over the next 30 years, 30% of that growth is going to go towards fees. Okay, now the other 30% is going to go to taxes. And then the other 30% is going to go to inflation. So what do I really have left? Nothing. I have the same dollar I started with, maybe even less. Right? So the fee this tiny little 1.25% or that tiny little 1% that we don't think anything of that compounds just like your interest does. So if you think about if my plan grew to a million dollars, a million dollar 401k or IRA, that means that my financial advisor made 300 grand in fees. I know you like your financial advisor, but let me ask you, is he worth $300,000? Because he's not doing anything special. What he does is a commodity. You could go buy the same thing on T. Rowe Price or Vanguard for free. Now, I wouldn't do T. Rowe Price or Vanguard because it's the stock market. But my point is, he's not doing anything special. So what is he actually doing to earn the $300,000? Nothing. That's just the fee structure. And you don't think about it because 1.25 seems like a really small number. Okay. But the bottom line is the only guarantee in the 401k or the IRA when you go with the Wall Street custodian is the fee. They can't promise you returns. They can't promise you safety. They can't promise you that, that anything will happen other than they get paid. Okay. So, so these are the issues that I have with the, the retirement plan. And again, it doesn't mean that retirement plans are going to you know, be a bad idea and you should never do them. Cause that's, that's what the mistake I made is I was like, okay, well, all retirement plans are the devil. So I'm never going to do one. Then they're all bad ideas. And then I missed out on, on being able to use them the right way for a number of years, because I wrote them off as all bad because of this. I didn't realize like I can actually set up my own firm. That's what I did. Actually. Wealth Dynamics, we've set up our own custodial firm and our own trust company. And guess what? We're not a wall street firm. We don't give a crap what you invest in. That means that you can set up a, a, a wealth dynamics IRA We'll do your plan docs. We'll do your custodian. We'll hold your funds. We'll set up your online account, all of that. And then you can go put it in gold, silver, real estate, and we will help you. That's, that's what we do. We're going to figure out how do we get it there? How do we make it happen? Let's help you do it. Okay. So guys, again, this has been our course, uh, part one on retirement plans. Okay. This is a lot of, this is from my book, how to create wealth by Jerry Feta. If you don't have a copy of this book, um, I suggest you go to jerryfeta.com. I want to give you a free copy. You cover your shipping, but you can buy a free copy of the book, or I guess get a free copy of the book. Um, if it's free, it's not buying. But again, jerryfeta.com, you can grab a free copy of the book. Today, we covered the 401k lie, okay? Because a lot of times we operate with retirement plans on lies. Everything I covered today from the match to the taxes to the the reason you do it, the purpose of it, how it was invented, the fact that you can only do it at work or with your financial advisor, those are all lies. Okay. Now the truth is in here. So if you don't have a copy of it, grab the book. What I want to do here though, is I'm going to go ahead and open this up for questions. Uh, see Don, that wasn't that bad. That was actually pretty good handwriting for, for the, the zoom tonight. I'm busting Don's balls. Cause he likes it better when I type, but I don't like typing. I like drawing. All right, let's see what we have. We're going to cover some questions. So if you guys have questions, um, drop them in the comments. If you're on Zoom, then we'll answer them live. If you're on Facebook, we'll answer it. Um, if you're on Instagram, we'll go ahead and answer these first. Instagram usually doesn't have any questions. Um, John, good, good to see you. Hello, everybody. Thank you guys for jumping on tonight. Uh, let's see here. Instagram, no questions yet. Harry A says, hello, Jerry, speak to me. 
with a little whisper face. That's contradicting, Harry. I don't know if I want to speak to you now. That's that's honestly a little confusing. Uh, how are you? Good. Uh, <laughs> YK Eric says no one cares, yet he's on the live stream. Apparently, YK Eric cares. Uh, let's see. Wow, we have someone from Kenya on. That's awesome. Good to see you. Uh, this person says, put it, put it into buying a new haircut. Touche. Like I said, I haven't had a haircut in eight months. So someone on Instagram is noticing another person just says sex. All right. And there are a bunch of middle fingers and whisper mark, whisper emojis. What's up, Aaron? Uh, white river rafting. Are you currently in Alaska? No, right now I'm in California. Uh, all right. So that's all I see on Instagram tonight. Unfortunately, uh, we'll try again with you guys. Maybe better luck next week with the intelligent questions. We're going to turn them off. I, I answer them and look at them because it really is comedic and I like sharing them with you guys, but I wish you could see all of, all of the interesting stuff we get on Instagram. Okay, good. So let's check out Facebook. Brad, good to see you. Nano, good to see you. Uh, William, good to see you. Todd, good to see you. Todd says, happy education Friday, always the best night of the week. Jerry simplifying the game that IRS Wall Street meant to seem complicated. That is super true. Thanks for being on, Todd. Aaron, good to see you. Uh, Todd says, what was that Corona IRA strategy? Can you explain that again? Yeah, so the um, in, in 2020, so it's, it's over now, but in 2020, you were allowed to withdraw the balance of your uh, retirement plan. If it was an IRA or a 401k or a like plan, you could withdraw that penalty free. And as long as you paid it back into a qualifying plan within three years of withdrawing it, then you have no in income tax either. Now, a qualifying plan, here was, the, here was the, the caveat, a qualifying plan does not mean the plan you took it out of, right? So imagine you have a 401k at work and, and you just became a client of ours. You're putting money in the 401k at work and you realize after watching one of my streams, the 401k at work is a bad idea. Number one, you're not in a financial position to do it because your debt to income ratio and your housing to income ratio are higher than your tax to income ratio. So you're like, man, I shouldn't do the 401k plus it's with Wall Street. So you stop doing the 401k. And now you're like, well, shoot, I can't use that money till I quit my job. So what we did is we said, well, no, no, no. You could take a Corona related distribution and then we're going to take that money and immediately pay it into a self-directed IRA. Meaning you're now in charge of where you can invest that money. And now you can access that 401k at work sooner than quitting the job or 59 and a half. So that's how that worked, Todd. That was over uh, as of uh, last month, but that's what we were doing all 2020 with people. Uh, Aaron says, Jerry, when are you no longer broke in your own opinion? No net, uh, what net worth? So Aaron, that's a good question. It has nothing to do with networks, net, net worth. So not being broke would mean that you're solvent. Okay. So you are solvent when your income exceeds your expenses. You have no consumer debt. You have six months in reserves in your sacred account. And then you've also got your, your, your risks covered. You're insured with things like health insurance and car insurance, and you're not skimping on any of those areas that you should be covered and you're credit worthy. So those are the five points. When you have all five of those points, you're no longer broke. Um, and that's really like the step before wealth, right? So I can't be wealthy if I'm not solvent. A lot of people skip solvency because it's not exciting. They're like, well, it was paying off my debt. It's kind of like someone saying like, how do I get in shape? And someone's like, eat less than you burn and go to the gym. That really is it. No one wants to do that because it doesn't sound cool. But if you get an energetic TV personality wearing a sweatsuit, giving you dance moves while you do it, now you're like, yeah, it's the same thing though. Okay. Um, William Goffner says, so if I get a dollar and get a match on the dollar, say 30K and I get 30K over so long, that's 60, but I get taxed up to like 90% over time. I just end up with my original dollar. That's a correct estimation, William. So you're getting a dollar, you're putting a dollar in the plan. So this is the way, and this is, it's kind of like a, a mind trick. I'm getting a free dollar, but in order to get the free dollar, I've got to give one up. And I can't have either of the dollars once I've done that. So did I really get any dollars? No, they're theoretical. 
The other problem with a 401k in Wall Street is I don't actually make anything till I withdrew more than I contributed. A lot of people think when their balance is higher than what they had put in that they made money. No, 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 no. You, the IRS won't tax that. If the IRS doesn't tax it, it doesn't exist. You don't have a gain till you sell. So until I've sold and withdrawn more money than I contributed, my net return on my retirement account is zero, right? So if I had to give up a dollar, put it into the retirement account to get a free dollar that also goes into the retirement account that I can't have till I'm 60, I didn't actually gain anything, even though it might look like it. So I don't gain anything until I pull out both dollars. Um, so I hope that that makes sense. William says, it seems like a wash or, or I still gain a little bit, but in life insurance, if I save a dollar and borrow, borrow a dollar, I'm just borrowing no match, but I have to pay back what I borrow. So that is the mistake, William. You do not have to pay back the dollar. With life insurance, you do not have to pay back the dollar. You should and you can because it's a good idea. It's kind of like owning your own gas station. You don't have to pay for your own gas. You could just take free gas and there's no problem with it, right? Now, business-wise, it makes sense to pay it back. And, and if you want to learn more about that, we can have a call set up with you and kind of go over how that works. But um, with the life insurance, you put in the dollar, that dollar grows, you borrow another dollar while the first one still grows. And then the second dollar you just borrowed, you go invest and or you, or you earn a rate of return greater than your cost of borrowing. So you have both dollars growing and then you never have to pay that second dollar back if you don't want to. But if I borrow, if I don't lose, I end up with anything. Uh, but when I borrow and if I don't lose, I don't end up with anything. So I think I explained that, William. And then with life insurance, the other thing is you can't lose. It's guaranteed against loss. So it, it's literally the only, only asset class that's never lost money and always made money. And it's guaranteed never to lose money. Um, so those, those are the benefits of using the life insurance. Good questions, William. All right, let me go ahead and set up uh, my headset. We're going to go live on Zoom and answer some questions here live on air. I love doing these lives. I like talking to you guys. I appreciate everyone on the lives because if it was me, I would be so much creepier than most of you just because it would be, be funny, like heavy, heavy breathing once you answered the live. All right, let me get my headset set up here. Okay, good. So let me go ahead. Move my plug in here on Zoom. Let me know if you guys can hear me okay. Good. Mike sounds good. Awesome. Okay. So uh, what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and answer some questions live on Zoom. First one is Avery. So let me go ahead and plug Avery in. I think I need to make myself the host again, actually. Good. We're getting it figured out. Okay, good. So Avery, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, my friend, and, and uh, you can ask your question live here. All right. We're live with Avery. Avery, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Jerry, how's it going? It's going good. How are you doing tonight? Hey, man. It's, it's awesome, man. Uh, Got to love the education on a Friday night. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. What's your question? How can I help out tonight? Yeah, the first question you pretty much answered throughout the call in terms of creating a self-directed IRA or a solo 401k, being able to roll out of roll over out of Wall Street by getting into alternative investments like precious metals, real estate, private lending, different businesses, etc. So you answered that question. Uh, my second one was how often do the tax laws change regarding retirement accounts or just overall in general? Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little bit of feedback, but again, I can hear now better. So Avery's, Avery's question is about um, 
rolling over from an IRA. So he's asking basically when you're putting money into like a self-directed account, um, you know, what, what can you put your money into outside of Wall Street alternative assets? So you can basically, as long as you're self-directed, you can basically do almost anything. So I like doing, you know, if it's a smaller account, typically gold and silver, just because you can buy that in smaller denominations. Um, but, you know, you can also do things like real estate, uh, you know, you can do private lending. So there's a lot of stuff you can do with that type of account. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I would say there, but you have to be self-directed. So if you're in a, a Wall Street custodial plan with your employer, then you, you are, are kind, kind of, of in, in, a, in a position, position where, where you can't, can't do, do much, much other, other than, than right? Um, so that's the first thing. Now, if you are in a plan like that, like I would stop contributing to it. I wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't try and like, you know, like grow at any extra in the Wall Street plan and put more into it. I just wait till you're in a good spot where you can leave off and end with the employer plan and get into the new one. Um, and if you can move it, then you can move it. So if it's an old plan, you can roll that over. You can do a direct transfer or a direct rollover. Um, and that's typically just a process of, you know, four to six weeks with paper, getting the new plan set up, getting the old one moved over and then investing it. Now, your question on tax laws, there's not really a pattern per se or a routine on when they're changed, it basically is just at the discretion of the IRS, right? So if you have like an IRS-based plan, they can really change that at any time. There's no pattern or time or, or, or season where they're gonna move that. It really is just when they decide to. So if you look at like an example of that could be like the traditional IRA, which came out in the 70s. And then if you look at, I think maybe 10 or 15 years later, they actually made it illegal. And then they brought it back again in the 90s totally up to their own whim. So there's no rhyme or reason why they did that is just what they decided to do. So that would be an example of that, but it's something you have to just kind of constantly pinch into and, and make sure that you're on top of. And then outside of that, really, you know, it doesn't change too much. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate your thoughts. Hey, absolutely. All right, so let's see what other questions we have here tonight. <laughs> I can see Don, Don's comment, don't draw. <laughs> it wasn't that bad, Don. Let's see. Any other questions here? All right, so Nano Aquino has a question about custodians. Let me go ahead and make Nano live here. All right, we are live with Nano Aquino. How are you doing, Nano? Doing great, Jerry, and you? Awesome, so what is your question? You had something about custodians, right? Yes, uh, I wanted to find out if the custodian is the one responsible for picking the investment. So the custodian is, is is responsible for record keeping and housing the funds they don't pick the investment per se like if you're self-directed you can pick the investment yourself but if you're in a custodial fund then yeah the custodian they don't pick the investment they just build the menu so they'll say here's the types of things you could invest in and that's it um and then basically you're kind of left with whatever they've given you so at what point do i do I, do I have, quote unquote, the legal right to pick the investment? Uh, do I have any kind of title within those three uh, segments in, inside the, the retirement account? Would it be, would it take any position on, on uh, from uh, like the inside the retirement plan? Or do I just tell them th or what to do? Yeah. So you're kind of asking like, at what point do you have control over it? That's correct. So if you're in a Wall Street plan, the answer, unfortunately, is never, um, which is kind of the downside of doing one of those plans. If you're self-directed, then you have control over it right away. The custodian, they have a job, but they work for you, right? So like, for example, with our self-directed accounts, like Wealth Dynamics has our own IRA company, and we do the custodial services and the trust services, but we cater toward what you're interested in, and then we help you invest in that way. So you can kind of pick your investments anyways, even though you're not the custodian. That makes sense. Thank you. Awesome. Great questions. Let's see what else we have here. All right. We have one here, I think from Robin. So I have 33 tax to get to income ratio. My bonuses get taxed at 50. 
Okay, Robin has a question on taxes. Let me go ahead and, and uh, add Robin here on the live. All right, we are live here with Robin. How are you tonight, Robin? Oh, I think we still have Robin on mute here. Hey, Robin, can you hear me okay? All right, we'll come back to Robin here. I'm not, not hearing her on the microphone. Let's see what other questions we have. Uh, Nano has a quick question again. He says, is the gold growth in correlation to the devaluation of the dollar? How is it measured? Uh, so gold growth is not necessarily a direct correlation to the value of the dollar, even though you, see, you will see some similarity. Let me fix my, my crazy hair here. Even though you will see, see some similarity with it, it's not an identical correlation. Um, so gold really, you know, you will see it go up if the dollar goes down in value, but you'll also see gold go up based on supply and demand based on, uh, you know, non-correlating or correlating markets. Like when the market, the stock market crashes, gold typically will go up. So there are other things that can drive the growth of gold. But the big thing that, that you want to pay attention to is with gold, it's not worth dollars. It's just being denominated by dollars. Right. So if I have an ounce of gold, an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold. It doesn't matter how many dollars fit into an ounce of gold. It doesn't change the value of an ounce of gold or its actual worth. It just is a change in the price denominated in dollars. It could go. It could be a higher value if I measured it in barrels of oil instead. Right. So it all depends on what am I dividing gold by? And if it's dollars, then, yeah, when I add more dollars to this currency supply, then it does take more dollars to buy gold. And that would reflect in gold's price going up. Uh, Don says he's doing everything he can to avoid banks, Wall Street, and government. Awesome. I love that. Uh, Keith says putting money into a 401k is similar to buying savings bonds from a fund's availability perspective. Uh, that's true. You don't have a lot of liquidity on, on your money if you do that, similar to a bond. All right. We have another question here. Let me see who this is. Okay, Jennifer has a question. Oop, she says, thanks again for sharing the info. What would you do if your employer allowed you to, to take a limited portion? Okay, let me go ahead and make Jennifer live here. We'll answer her question. Hey, how's it going, Jerry? Hey, Jerry. There she is. Hey, Jennifer, how are you doing tonight? Doing well. It's uh, Jennifer and Daniel here tonight. Hey, guys. Good to see you and hear you. Hey, yeah. thanks again. Awesome. So you have a question about the CARES Act, right? Yeah. So, uh, so what would you recommend if uh, if the if the company only allowed you to take out a certain amount of money? Would you uh, would you leave the rest in there while you work towards being becoming accredited, or would you find a different way of uh, rolling that out to somewhere else? So if you can pull it out earlier than that, I would. Now, depending on if you can or not, that's really the thing to answer there. And that's you know, is there another way you can pull it out? Do you plan on leaving that employer anytime? Uh, are there any provisions on, on the plan that allow you to take it out while you're still working? And if so, I would definitely do that. If we've been not, trying, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. We, we've been trying to take it out and they won't let us take out any more than we, we did with the CARES Act and that was it. I see. Okay. So that's probably going to be one. Unfortunately, you just have to wait till you leave that employer. Uh, and then at that point, you know, you can move it over. So I wouldn't keep putting money into it and I would put it in something that, you know, is not going to lose money and that you understand. And that way it can just ride out and then it's there when you need it. And when you can roll it, at least you have your money there. Right on. Thanks, Jerry. Hey, absolutely. Good to talk to you guys tonight. You too. Take care. All right. Let's see what other questions we have here. Avery says stop payments on Roth this year. Awesome. 
Yeah, those of you guys that are, are clients of mine, if you're doing a Roth IRA, there is no tax difference between a Roth IRA and a sacred account. So the sacred account, you put money in after taxes and it grows tax-free. Same with the Roth, but the sacred account you can use now. The Roth, you've got to wait till you're 59 and a half. So again, the Roth probably also is with Wall Street. It actually looks like Robin figured her mic out. Let me add her back in here so she can ask her question as well. And again, if you guys have any final questions, we're wrapping up here, but if you have any final questions, go ahead and drop those in the comments on Zoom here and I'll get back to them. I think we have a few more on Facebook we'll cover in a little bit here as well. Hey, Robin, can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear me? I can. Yay. How are you tonight? I'm <laughs> good, how are you? Good. Good. So I'm actually with my husband, Bruce, and he was the one that typed in the question before. It might have disappeared because when I fixed my mic, I think it kicked us out of the meeting for a sec. I see. I found it here. Oh, good. So you guys have a 33% tax to income ratio. You yeah. get bonuses that are taxed at 50%. But when you put the bonuses in the Roth 401k, they only get taxed at 33% which is the same as your income. Yeah. So basically the way that my company works is that they allow us to do a full Roth 401k. Um, so it's not deferred income, but with our bonus structure, the way it works, since it does not go towards our normal compensation, it is considered like unlike knowable for the tax rate. So they just do 50% across the board. Um, so I'm being highly taxed on my bonuses instead of uh, having it go towards my normal income. And so by putting it in the Roth, I'm actually saving about 20% tax-wise um, on that uh, income. I see. So that could be a good move. I would look at, again, what is your debt-to-income ratio? And then also, what is your housing-to-income ratio? And if those are higher than what you're paying on the Roth or on the, on the income tax, then I definitely would go for those instead. If your income tax rate is much higher then it does make sense to reduce that. Now, there are other things you can do other than just your employer plan. So that's another avenue to explore is are there other tax deductions we could take advantage of with that Roth bonus money that mm -hmm. keep you in a little more control? Um, so those are, those are a little more tailored and custom to maybe where your situation is at and kind of looking at what fits and what doesn't, but there are some other options you guys could look at. Okay, and then I have a second question on top of that. I pulled out uh, money for part of the CARES Act uh, to pay off debt, basically. And so now I have three years to pay it back, and this would be a good time to put, choose a new avenue, correct? Yeah. yeah. So I would be paying that back into a self-directed IRA rather than the plan you took it from. So you've got to pay that back within 36 months, and then you usually you get refunded whatever the taxes were if they took any out. And if they didn't, you just won't owe. But I would be paying that back into a self-directed IRA. That way you have immediate control over those funds, and you can keep them in that account and use them now. Awesome. Okay. Anything else, honey? Uh, no, I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Ray. Awesome. Good to talk to you guys. You All right. Let me see if we have any other questions here tonight on Zoom. Good. So those are the only questions we have on Zoom here. Uh, I have a couple more I see on Facebook, and then we'll wrap up here tonight. Aaron says, did you ever consider a CPA? Uh, Aaron, I have CPAs that work for me. So I've never considered being one just because I have hired them and they work for me. But I, I think I get your question. Uh, Jeffrey asked, what are your thoughts on Roth that raised? I kind of answered that already. So I think we're good there. Good. Let me see if there's anything else on Zoom before we sign out. I know we went a little bit later than our, our usual time. Awesome. That's it. So guys, we're going to tune out here. Thank you for tuning in and watching again. If you just watched this today and you want to learn more, um, reach out to my team and I, you can always grab a free copy of my book, how to create wealth by Jerry Feta. You can go to jerryfeta.com in order to get that. And I will talk to you all next week. We'll be covering part two of retirement accounts. Have a great weekend. I'll see you next time.